time and gave them a trophy, and they lined up on the third base. So they had a first place trophy as champions. They had the second place trophy as the, the co-champs over here. And then the rest of us, they'd say, hey, we hope you've had a great summer, enjoyed your baseball. We're going to announce All-Stars in a few days. If you don't mind, uh, enjoy your free hot dog, your free snow cone, and have a great summer. And what did all the kids do? Cheered. Cheer. Cheer. And what did we do? Y'all seen it? Jumped up and ran like, like, like mice, right? Just as fast as you can to get the, the... If you've ever seen a foul ball in a little league game, you can see kids sprint, right? So you got all these kids. That's how it ended. That was the end of closing ceremonies. Let's now move to the mid-'80s. My wife and I dated all through high school. I'm over at her house on a Saturday afternoon. I'm a senior in high school. Uh, I'm over at her house, and, and we live in the country. I don't think I told you that, but I mean, I literally live in the sticks. Like, I live where I, where I lived when I was a kid. I don't live in that house, but in the small little community. So I'm over at her house, and uh, her little brother comes up. His name's Shiloh. He's a millennial. He's about six years old at the time of this story. He's got his uh, soccer uniform on. He comes up and says, Kevin, are you going to come watch my game today? Oh yeah, I'm gonna come watch you go. We gotta drive to Abilene to the city, you know, and watch a little soccer. <laughs> so I go. I, 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 follow, I mean, I don't follow. We go to town that 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 morning, and they're playing soccer. Well, just real quickly, you need to know I am very competitive. I, I like to win. I, just, I like sports. I, just, I love that sort of stuff. And uh, I'm watching him play. Now remember, I'm 18 years old. I'm watching him play, and after about 13 or 14 seconds, I realize something about Shiloh. He doesn't have any soccer talent, right? I mean, it ain't like me at all. I mean, I, here comes the ball. He can just see it. He's thinking, oh, I mean, and, I, and this is like driving me nuts. I'm like, dude, get in there. At least run over somebody. Let's just trip them. I mean, I, there's got to be something better than this. Well, after about three minutes, I realized nobody on shallow soccer team has any what? No soccer talent. I mean, like, it just gets stolen and buried in the back of the net, and they kick off, and, they, and, and after, you know, a few minutes, I'm like, you know what? It's okay. Obviously, they are not going to win. It's okay. They're having fun. Literally, I'm thinking, you know what? If I was a coach, I'd just put all eight of them right there at the goal. Just stand there like this. like Just at least you'll lose three to nothing, you know, instead of 100 to nothing. But anyway, if it's good, the day's over. Three or four weeks later, I'm back over Shiloh's at my, at my wife, at Marcy, uh, my girlfriend's house at the time. And Shiloh comes up, and it's probably three or four in the afternoon. He's got, he's got a soccer uniform on again. He's got his hand behind his back, and he comes up and he says this. Kevin, guess, guess what I got? I don't know. What have you got? And remember, I'm 18. And he goes like this. Guess what he pulled around from behind his back? Trophy. Yeah, he, he pulled a trophy. I glanced over at his mom like this, and she's like, that, that's his uh, that's closing ceremony trophy today. That's what he gets for what? That's his participation trophy. Now, listen, I did not do what I'm about to tell you, but I thought it. As an 18-year-old, I'm thinking to myself, what? You're the worst. Get that sucker right out of here. But I didn't do that. But here's the thing. All of you right now are amen, right? You're all like, amen, Kevin. But here's the deal. I got a question for you. Who thought of that? Who created this idea? Amen, brother millennial. Who thought of giving everybody a participation trophy? Let's go back to 1975, right? Remember when we were all sitting on the base pads that night? I'm assuming that, you know, the Xers, now it's us. I'm assuming the Xers were sitting there going, hey, how come I didn't get a trophy, Dad? Instead of them going, because you're not any good at baseball. <laughs> We said, well, when you get older, maybe you can just, you know, give everybody a, give everybody a trophy. And you know what happens when Linda was over here clapping? Do you know where your participation trophies are? No! Do you even want them? No! Here's the thing. Here's the reason I, I'm screaming this at you is because sometimes we start thinking, well, they're just so entitled. They won't do anything for it unless you give them a trophy. That's not true. Whose fault is it? Say it. Our. It's our. Yeah, don't say Gen X. It's boomers, Xers. It's our. It's, it's our fault. I promise you, no child has ever said, "Hey, I want to. I want to do baseball," but they're gonna have to give me a trophy if I'm. A, it doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, I will tell you. Some of you gonna think I'm pretty cruel, but I. But I try to. I try to teach my kids. Try to do things a little bit different. I coach for both my girls in soccer. Um, my youngest one, I was not the head coach for my, for my oldest one, but the youngest one I was. And we played, you know, they start playing when they can barely walk. I mean, literally the ball is like a Swiss, you know, it's like kicking this ball that's as big as them. 
every year, I mean, we had we two seasons. We had ended up at the end of the season going to Mr. Gaddy's or Chuck E. Cheese for a pizza party, right? And those little girls look at me and say, Mr. Tack, when are we going to get our, when are we going to get our participation trophy? <laughs> and what do you think I said? We don't have one. Now you're like, that's wrong. Like, that's not either. It just said on there. Soccer, 2010. I mean, it, that's all it said. But here's the really awful thing. I didn't give them to them. I, had a, I have a garage. I finally just chunked them. I didn't give them to them. You know what you deserve? You deserve some pizza and a pat on the back. Because you're awesome, and I love you, and you're good, but, but we're not champions of anything. We, we just participated. <laughs> Let me tell you something about that little crew, that little group of girls. When they were 12 years old, we won our league. We went to Dallas, Texas, and won the North, Dallas, the North Texas State Championship in soccer. That's pretty stinking big, by the way, if you're into soccer. This was under 12 girls, state champions. When we got home, we had a pizza party. And guess what I gave them? I gave them a state champion trophy. Do you, do you think that meant something to them? Of, of course it did. So the reason I'm sharing that with you is they're special, but it's not by design. They didn't wake up some morning and say, make me special. We made them special. And I'm going to be honest with you. If my kids came here to Central Texas College, I don't know about the other kids, but my two girls, they are special, right? That's supposed to be funny, by the way. <laughs> because, see, my kids are special, but yours are not. But everybody thinks their kids and grandkids are what? Special. They just think they're special. And, and it's, it's nothing we can change. There's, there's millions of them. We're not going to say, you're not special, get over it. Okay? <laughs> they're truly going to be this, they're gonna be this way. So, Number one is they're special. Number two is they are sheltered. It's the most sheltered generation that we have ever had. What I mean by that is, uh, I could, my, my wife, I, I told you this, my wife is the elementary uh, secretary at Jim Ned Elementary in Buffalo Gap, Texas. Um, my sister is the elementary principal there. And I'm driving by one day, uh, and if you've ever been to Buffalo Gap, it's just real quick. You just drive through some little oak lot, and bam, that's it. So I drove through there, and one of, one of the pieces of playground equipment is missing. So I, I called my wife, and I said, hey, where's the, whatchamacallit? She said, oh, it, we had to get rid of that. I said, why? She said, because it looked too what? Dangerous. It looked too dangerous. I said, hey, let me talk to Christy. That's my sister. She gets on the phone, and I said, why, why did y'all get rid of that? She said, well, the new superintendent. You know, it feels like it's too dangerous. We've got to get rid of it. No playgrounds. I mean, we've had it for, you know, maybe 10 years longer than we're supposed to, but they finally said, hey, we've got to get rid of it. So we got, I said, do we have any documentation of any child ever being hurt on that apparatus? And they're like, well, not that we know of, but I said, so we got rid of it because it looks dangerous. What piece of equipment am I talking about? No, no, no. Somebody said, the merry-go-round. The merry-go-round. And I will admit it had been there since Buffalo Bill lived in Buffalo Gap. I mean, it, it had a ditch like a moat. You could literally like NASCAR, like you could run the curb. I mean, it, was, it had been there, and I want to say generations after generations have run circles around this thing. This is like historic, but we had to get rid of it because it looked what? Dangerous. It, and it did. It looked like at some point it could just suck a kid and spit them out. We got rid of it though, right? Well, it may have been good to get rid of because it probably was the, the best bullying device on the playground. I mean, you've seen the bullies get someone on there like, ah, ah, you know, it just keeps from some poor kid like, let me off, and it just keeps spinning it. But here's the thing. We had another piece that they got rid of that same year. It was, now, I don't know how hot it gets here yeah. in August. Yeah, yeah like in the hundreds, like yeah. at least 110 or so. But we had these, and, and y'all grew up with them, and we had them for a long time. We got rid of the slide. It was like 12 feet tall, and it was made out of sheet metal, right? I mean, it, it's got to be, like you can, when you say fry an egg, I mean, like you could pour pancakes, and they would just make one long pancake. I mean, it's just scalding hot. So let me share something. We got rid of that. Why? Not because it was hot, because it looked white. 
It looked dangerous. Okay, I'm going to give you a statistic. I'm not making this up, but I read a research. Do you know what the number one complaint from college professors is about today's graduates from high school? Number one complaint. They can't write. They can't what? Write. Right? It's they don't have critical thinking skills. They have no critical thinking skills. Well, let me share something with you. If they had left that stinking slide in that in that go round, them kids would have some critical thinking. Amen, right? Because when you're when you're six years old and you're climbing to the top of a 200 degree slide, you realize, hey, if I'm going to the bottom, I need to get someone under me, right? You ride them down. And that poor kid's like, ah, ha! And guess what? The one on the bottom learns something, like, hey, don't go in front of everybody. The people behind, you get this, right? We, we have sheltered them to where literally, I, and I hate to say this, I'm going to say amen because I love speaking to, to the faculty of colleges anyway. You guys really are dealing with, I, I also build houses. I don't, but I've got a home building, a construction company. We literally, and I'm not making this up and you guys know this is a fact, I literally can't find young subs that can solve a problem. Literally. Literally. Like, hey, uh, I think the white and the khaki are going to mix together. What do you want me to do? I don't know. What do you think you ought to do? I don't know. I guess. I guess I'll just go home. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know what that blue tape is over there? Oh, yeah. I've, I've seen that stuff. You know? <laughs> like, you're going to get up there and you're going you're gonna to tape it off. Tape what off? Well, you want me to just do it? <laughs> Isn't that how we feel? Yeah, you're like, where, where, why can you not figure this out? How do you even get up in the morning and get somewhere, right? <laughs> the reason I think we lack critical thinking skills, and I, and I don't have any research, is because we truly have removed the risk. We truly have removed. Think about this. When's the last time you bought a bicycle? Raise your hand if you bought a bicycle in the last 10 years. You bought a bike in the last Okay. When you went up to the register at, at Walmart or Target or Academy and you put that bike up there, what else did you have with it? Uh, Helmet, what else? Pads, knee pads, knee pads, shoulder pads, I mean elbow pads, chest protector. They literally look like an NHL goalie, right? Yeah. I mean, you, they could fall over and be drug and they're not going to get scratched, okay? We've removed the risk. You see, when I grew up, my brother taught me how to ride a bike. He's four years older than me. We're Latsky kids. Lucky we made it, okay? So we went home. We rode a bus. We, re we really rode a bus. You know what? It was weird. I hate to say this, but if we had problems with somebody on the bus, you just what? That a boy. I didn't say it. <laughs> you have problems with somebody on the bus, you just figure it out. And if they go, hey, he won't let me sit in the back. Well, guess what? Set your butt in the front, you know? Either get muscled up or set in the front. There, there's ways to solve these sort of things, but here's the thing. So we rode a bus home. The parents are not home. They're working till 5. They're not going to be home till 6. So he wanted to teach me how to ride a bus. I am not making this up. I rode a bus for 45 minutes when I was 5 years old. I mean, that's just how it was. Mom and Dad are like, hey, we're going to work. It's dark. Get to school, right? And you're just, you just got on the bus. If you forgot your lunch, you did what? Star. You just don't eat? Or you ask them, hey, like, get away from my food, right? It's just the way it was. So he get home, he's going to teach me how to ride a bike. So we got this bike, and I'm about six years old. He sticks me on there. What does he do? He just shoves me. Now, we live on a caliche road. Y'all know caliche is not Ben 10. Like, Ben 10 is crushed little powdery stuff like on an infield of baseball. Caliche is like big rock. Like it's just <laughs> boulders, right? So I have this Caliche, Caliche road. He just throws me. What do I do? I just crash. I get up. I got wide. I'm like, God, I'm bleeding. I got blood. Hey, good job. Get on there. Stick me on there. He shoves me again. What do I do? I fall again. I'm just bleeding. I'm like, oh my God. And he just keeps on and on. About the third or fourth time, out of necessity, what do I do? I pedal that baby. <laughs> So I'm like, no, I'm not coming back. <laughs> I get on the bike, I come back. Mom and Dad get home about 6 o'clock, and what do I show them? Did I have learned that? No, I don't show them the blood. This is dried and gone. I show them that I can what? I 
kind of showed me in the back of the ride. Did you get a trophy? I didn't get a trophy for it. I got these right here. These are my trophies, you know. But here's the deal. I, I didn't say he hurt me. I just said, hey, look, I can ride a bike. And dad's like, hey, it's about dang time. You're six years old. Come on, man. You know? But here's the thing. It was different. We didn't have the shelter. We, we weren't protected. I mean, we didn't have we didn't have guards on our chains. Remember, you'd be riding the bike and I'll say, <laughs> and you're like, hey, wake up! And you're like, just, anybody else with me? You're staying up. And then you're whipping your pants out of there. Now you've ripped your tough skins. So when mom and dad get home, what's happening? Oh, you're getting a beating. It doesn't matter. You cannot explain, hey, I, there's no chain guard, father. If you had a chain guard, I wouldn't have known. He's like, you ripped your teeth. Tough skins are unrippable. What's wrong with you? I'm like, well, I, I don't know. I can rip anything. <laughs> we finally survived the shelter years. Okay? So they're very special. They're sheltered. But let me share something with you. Once again, it's not what? It's not our fault. It's not their fault. <laughs> yeah. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. And I'll be honest with you. My kids are special. I want Kelsey and Carson to have everything that I didn't have. That's why we do it. Yeah. My kids wear helmets because you know what? I know what this felt like to have bloody arms. So you know what? I put them in all the gear and all the stuff, and I'm just as guilty. I can honestly remember telling Kelsey one time when she was about maybe maybe 13. In 13 when their brains just go to mush. I can specifically remember telling her as she left that went from the living room into the bedroom. I said, you are an absolute spoiled brat. And then this little boy said, and it's all your fault, daddy. <laughs> right? And I went in and I apologized. I said, hey, and I just got like, you're a spoiled brat. And I'm like, no, oh, hey, listen. And I just, because we, we have done this. Um, we have made them special. And we have children. And when I do, I want my kids wearing seatbelts. We do. My dad brought home like a 1980 Bronco one year, a Ford Bronco. What's the first thing he did to that vehicle? You took the seatbelts out, right? I mean, we don't have seatbelts in here. We're driving, we're bouncing around, you know, kids are off. I mean, you don't have seatbelts in any of this stuff, okay? Third thing is this. It wakes up. Okay, very team-oriented. Very team-oriented. Now, this is important. I want you to start thinking differently about this. They are, they, they love teams. Um, I'm going to share something with you. Uh, my daughter, when she was a senior in high school, she came home. And uh, it was like the second or third day. She said, hey, Dad, four or five friends are coming over tonight uh, to work on calculus. I immediately like, hey, you having some problems in calculus? Like I could help. I just be in there, you know, <laughs> the dad. She said, no, we're not having problems. It's, uh, it's my pod group. I go, what do you mean your pod group? <laughs> what does that mean? She said, well, it's, it's a group. There's like 20 of us. It's an AP class, AP uh uh, math class, and it's, you know, I said, okay, so what are y'all going to do? She said, well, there's, there's, there, we only have, there's like six of us, and they're going to come over, and we're going to work on our, on our uh, calculus, and I said, so y'all are going to work on it together and turn it in and get the same grade? And she goes, hmm? Because this is confusing to them. Why would even be asking this? I said, you're going you're gonna to work on your assignments together and turn it in and get the same grade? She said, well, not really. Um, because when the pod groups, like before class, I mean like the first few, few minutes of class, and the other pod groups, if they got an answer that we don't have or it's different, then they're going to kind of show us how they got it, and then we'll correct our answers, and that's how, that's how it goes. So I'm sitting there, you know, i got to remember back to the, to the 80s when I was in calculus. Well, I wasn't in calculus. <laughs> we had this thing called FOM, and y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Fundamentals of math, but it wasn't even fundamentals. It was like, hey, two plus two is, if you got two apples over here, you have okay. But anyway, so I said, okay, so Kelsey, we need to get this right. You have a pod group. You're going to turn in this homework assignment. You're all going to get, and that's an AP class. You're all going to get the same grade, right? She goes, yeah, I mean, that's how it's meant to be because we're kind of teaching each other how to come, how we came to the, form, the formulas, how we came to the right answer. She said, she's trying to explain this like a champion. I'm like, Kelsey, that, that sounds like... It's not like cheating to me, right? <laughs> she goes, what do you mean it's not like cheating? I'm like, well, if you're all just getting this, I she goes, but we're teaching each other. I go, man, I wish I'd have been in your AP class. I could have pulled an A too. I mean, crud. You know, if everybody's going to tell me the answer, I'd be like, hey, you just tell me what you got. I'll put it down. And then it dawned on me, Xers, boomers, we, we had pot groups, but we just met like 
a minute before class starts, hey, what are you doing? Seven, what are you doing? Right. Here he comes, here he comes, what are you doing? I mean, I mean we, right? We called it cheating. We called it copying. Now we call it what? Pie crew. <laughs> The reason I share that with you is I'm going to guess the majority of you in here recognize this, and you probably got pod groups. You probably don't call them pod groups. But you let them work because here's what we've discovered. Our perception was wrong. You get it? I couldn't learn geometry from my teacher, but, I, but if somebody would show me how they got it, but we just ran through it and called it cheating. The reality is they love teams. They love doing team things. Now, not all of them. Now, they, they don't think 100% of your your your, your Students want to work in clusters. They, they don't. But the majority of them like working in teams. When I went back to get my master's degree, this was the worst experience of my life. Um, went back to get my master's degree. I was like 33. So I am like the old dude. And no, not the master's one. It was, that was awesome. But I go in and the, the first class is behavior, uh, organizational behavior. And uh, it, was, it met for like two hours, just like two days a week in the evenings. And when I went in there, I was just, uh, I was just blown away. Now, these, these students are in there, and, and they're making an assignment. He gives us a, a team assignment. But I do have to say this. Have y'all ever noticed how, how bachelor's programs are different than master's programs? Did I get an amen on that? Yeah. Holy smoke. That first class I went to for master's, I was like, where have you been? Like, you, you have that. Right? Like, this is really cool. And I'm thinking to myself, why, why don't others teach? Well, I'm going to get on that here just a little bit. But anyway, so he gives an assignment, writes us into six or seven, you know, put six or seven on the team. And at this point, I'm working at Hendrick Medical Center. I'm doing leadership and organizational development there for the hospital. And I am like, man, I am all about this teamwork deal. We're going to crush this out of the park. I had just learned how to use PowerPoint. I learned how to do all this awesome stuff. I mean, we're going to... We're going to kill this. So I get my little group, and we're all split up, you know, before we dismiss from class. And I think there's a couple girls, a couple guys, and I said, hey, 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 here's what we're going to do. Once we pick our assignment, we, we've already picked it, I said, I, I work full time doing this. So if you guys want to kind of get your stuff and just email it to me, text me, you're, you're, we're going to break it, kind of divide it up, and then I'll put it together in this really awesome presentation. I mean, I'll put the bells and whistles on it, I'll, I'll get all this stuff, and it'll, it'll be awesome. And they're all looking at me like this. They're like, what? <laughs> I go, you do your part, you do your part, you do part, your part, I'll do my part, and we'll put it all together. It'll be awesome. And they look at me and they go, well, Mr. Tut, um, this is a, a team project. And then it dawned on me, what? I wasn't teaching team, right? I was teaching, hey, let's just let one dude off, do off. And then they said this, Mr. Tut, do you have a, a calendar? Well, of course I got a calendar. I got it right here on my phone. Um, I think if it's all right with you, we just we don't like to meet at Starbucks. And I'm like, I ain't meeting y'all at Starbucks. I got a family. <laughs> Man, ain't doing this, right? <laughs> did I meet them at Starbucks? Yes. yes, I did. And you know what? I learned something about teamwork. The reason I'm sharing that with you is they don't want to know. They want to know the reasons. They want to know, well, if, you can, if we got four different sections, I want to know how all of those came about. And that's just sort of the way they're, they're wired. They're just like, you know what? And not everybody. Some of them would be like, hey, let's take time. And he'll make it do it for us. <laughs> so special shelter team. And the last one is this. The last one is achievers. I promise you. The last one is achievers. And here's what I mean by that, because I want to make this clear. It does not mean they do great things. Some of them do. But some of you are looking at this like, ah, some of my people are pretty low achievers. Here's what this means, okay? Achievers simply means they like to check the boxes. They really do. They like to check the boxes. I'll just, I, I talk to a lot of high school faculty, and I'll share this with you. In high school projects, when we, when we were in school, a, a project might last for six weeks. Am I the only guy that had to squish flowers and turn in a flower project in their entire life? Did that mean? Did anybody else do this? Okay. So you were given the, the assignment, and then you turned in the flowers at the end of the deal, right? They hate that stuff. <laughs> Not the project. They want to have some sort of six, some some sort of feedback when now, like every moment. They want to know what. How am I doing? I was good with this. We grew up, Xers and Boomers. We are the king and queens of procrastination. I don't 
need to turn something in until the day before, right? I don't want you checking my progress every minute of the day. This group is different. And the reason I share that with you is, you know what? They check the progress of everything in their life just like this. As a matter of fact, most of you check progress the same way. Don't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass you, but I guarantee you somebody in here has looked at a tweet or an Instagram or a, a, a Facebook post to check your progress while I've been speaking. <laughs> right? Let me share what check your progress. You're wanting to see, has anybody liked it? Has anybody responded to it? Has anybody made a comment? Because we like what? We like feedback. Even Xers and Boomers, our society has changed. Now, some of you are like, I have not looked at mine, Kevin. I promise you. But you're dying until you're like, I really got in my chair. I can't see it. But we like to check that progress. So, these are the four things we start talking about the millennials. I want you to kind of be aware of. So, like, what I'm going to ask you to do when we start connecting with, these, with today's students is this. We have to start seeing change differently. We have to see change differently. I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example of, of a paradigm shift or a change in perspective. A good friend of mine is a salesman. Uh, he lives in Atlanta, Georgia. I've done some training with him and his company, and he told me this story, and I thought, that is the ultimate change in perspective and seeing things differently. Uh, he's trying to fly home to Atlanta one day. Uh, I can't remember what, what city he was in, but he, he gets to the airport. He's wearing a coat and tie, a uh, jacket just like that. He said he gets to the airport, and he gets there, gets to his gate. He's got about a 45-minute layover before they take off, before they board. So he goes down to the little convenience store there, the little newsstand, and he buys him a bottle of water and a package of crackers, little cheese crackers. Well, he goes over to his gate, and if you guys, when you fly, you know, you've got those, those little chairs, and, and beside some of them, there's a little table, right? you got the little square table, little triangle table. But you got the little table beside some of them. So he sits down, and right beside him is kind of an elderly gentleman. And uh, he sits down there and takes his jacket off and places it over the back of this chair, and just kind of relaxing, and said he reached down and picked up his bottle of water, takes the lid off, gets him some water, puts the water bottle down, reaches over and picks up that package of crackers, opens up his crackers, and puts it in his mouth, puts the crackers back down, and the little gentleman, elderly gentleman beside him, he, he picked up his crackers, and he got one. He put it down, and the next guy's name is Brian. Brian said it was really awkward. So he eats that cracker. No, the gentleman didn't say anything. He just ate the cracker. <laughs> they didn't make a lot of eye contact. He picked it up again, got it, and he's thinking maybe I should hang on to it. But he put it back down, and sure enough, the guy reached over. He got it. He gets a cracker. Now Brian's like, this is so awkward. Because they haven't had any conversation. They haven't made real eye contact. So he said, I'll tell you where this is going. If I'm going to get half my crackers, I better keep going. So he eats the third one, and sure enough, the, the, the little gentleman beside him, he eats the third one. So basically, they split the crackers. Never said a word. Uh, a few minutes later, they said, hey, we were boarding the, the airplane. And they got up to get on. He grabbed the trash, throws it away, gets his water bottle. And he said the whole time he's thinking to himself, what is wrong with this guy? I mean, he didn't ask. He didn't, he, 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 I don't know if he has any money. I mean, I'd go buy him some if he needs some, get him some water. I don't know if he just, I really don't know what's going on in his mind. It's just, that was just very awkward and, and different. Well, he gets on the plane, and the little man in front of him, he can see he's back at the back of the plane. And he's got his jacket on, and got his uh, backpack. He said he gets on, puts his water, throws his stuff in the over, overhead bin, and he slips his, gets ready to slip his jacket off to throw it up there. And as he does, he hears something. And, and he pulls the vest of his jacket back. He reaches in his pocket. And he pulls out his package of crackers. Oh. Oh. What you just experienced is a change in perspective. Because you, just like Brian, were thinking the same thing. Who in their right mind would eat another person's crackers? But the whole time he was what? He was wrong. He was the idiot eating somebody else's crackers, right? And here's the, the reason I share that with you is this is so critically important. If Brian had not found those crackers, he would have sworn, what? That the guy was eating his crackers. But the reality was what? He was not. You are wrong, but you are convinced. The reason I share that with you when we start talking about the, the generation is we have to have a change in perspective. Because we're thinking, Kevin, they're entitled. 
They're brats. They're this. They don't have a work ethic. They don't have this. You can name all the things. You know what? I'm just sorry, but you're wrong. It may seem that way. But when you, and you, some of you right now at work, you're like, you know what, Kevin, you're right about some of them, but there are people that in this group, there are students that are just killing it. They're awesome. They're amazing. So I want you to think when those students show up to your classes, when do they, they all start classes? Monday? You're going to have to see things differently. Because the second they open their mouth, the second they sit down, the second they start doing the things that they do that gets on your nerves, you're going to start thinking about me. And you're going to go, okay. Not that I get on your nerves. I'm just saying. You're going to think about me and start thinking, why do they think this way? Because trust me, they were not raised. It's just a different world. It really is a different world. So we start talking about a change, uh, see change differently. I want to, want to share something with you about, uh, about this generation and why. It was, it, it, it'll become very clear in a second. My brother and I, when I start talking about change differently, my brother and I had this great gift for Christmas. Uh, again, I've been in the 70s. We got this gift. Now, this was back in the day when you only got, like, how many Christmas gifts? One. One or two. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like, hey, honey, I got my, you know, daughter one got seven gifts, so we need to go get daughter two seven gifts, and oh, we got, oh, we got her nine gifts. We got, I mean, am I the only parent that goes through this every Christmas? Yeah. Some of, okay. So we got this one gift. We opened it up. We're fired up. We take it out of the box, we walk over, we set it on our massive TV, you know, it weighed like 300 pounds, went around behind and hooked up a couple of wires, flipped it on, and guess what we were playing? The greatest, we thought it was the greatest <laughs> game ever in this, this remote right here. Oh, right, there it is. Yes, there it is right there. How many of you had Pong? Okay, we love punk. And let me just tell you something. For like a 10-year-old and a 14-year-old boy, we thought this was what? This, listen, say it. Life could never get any better, right? I mean, how in the world did something go from a cardboard box to my TV? They're geniuses. I don't know how they do it. I mean, and really, for, for hillbillies like us, we're like, this is the greatest thing ever, right? But this is all we want. This is all we knew. This is all we ever known. We'd never seen anything like this. So we played Pong for hours. Look, the ball is not even round. <laughs> the graphics are so horrible. And it's one dimensional. It just goes, the little sticks go up and down. That's it. Up, that, that's it. I mean, we, we were just like, oh, we thought, man, we're going to be, when we get back to school, we're rich. We got a Pong game, right? We got another game a few Christmases later. I'm guessing some of y'all have played this for a few thousand hours while you were traveling. Uh, we got this game right here. Do you remember this? Yeah. This is Mattel football. You see the little red dashes? You control the up and down and the forward, and they come at you about this fast. <laughs> Your job is to avoid them. So, what part of this game reminds us of football? <laughs> Just the green and the, and the yard line, right? Listen, there is no part of this that resembles football. Nothing. No part of this resembles football. This is what we grew up with in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s, actually in the 80s. Uh, this came out in the 80s. Uh, we had the Mattel, we had this, and we thought, man, Honestly, people, we thought that, didn't we? Yet nothing can ever be any better. These people must be geniuses. I mean, I bet, they, I bet they're billionaires for, for making a game so awesome like this. Let me share something with you about your students, your kids, and your grandkids. The majority of you sitting in this room, with the exception of the millennials, the majority of you grew up with this and Pong. That is your benchmark. This was football for us. For those, this is what they're, yeah, it's John Madden, it's Madden football. How many of y'all have seen this? Or have grandkids? This, this is all they want for, all they want for Christmas is a $90 Madden game, right? Madden 17, Madden 18, Madden 19, Madden 14, that's right. Let me share something with you. This is what? 
exactly like what? Say it. <laughs> this is exactly like football. This is exactly like football. I, I can't say it loud enough or strong enough. They act like them. They walk like them. They talk like them. They have the mannerisms. They select the plays. They select the offense, the defense. They select the players. They, they, can, pull, they can call stunts. They can call... They can change, all. they can make audibles, they can, they can do every single thing that you do on the football field except you don't actually have to what? You don't have to play. But this is RFK Stadium in Washington. That's the 30 yard line. That is RG3 right there. That's, they put electrodes on him and literally videoed him. If y'all seen the NBA stuff, it's unreal. It's almost like, why don't y'all just watch the real game and just pretend like you're playing? <laughs> oh, I had a good shot I just made. That you're really up bit because it's so real. Why am I telling you this? The reason I'm telling you this, this is the expectation that comes into the classroom today. Not Mattel. Not a blinking light. Does that make sense? For some of us, we're thinking, but Kevin, it was good enough. It was, but it's not. Okay, we had another game. Because we did have some cool stuff in the 80s. We had this game right here. We had these aliens that came down to Earth. We had to defend ourselves. You remember what this game right here is? Space Invaders. Yes! This was the pinnacle. This is, this is two-dimensional. Not only does the little thing go side to side, it goes up and down. But we had some, we had these aliens that were attacking us. Uh, they were just some calisthenic doing dudes. They love jumping jacks. They were, here's the whole sound from Space Invaders. Like, That's the whole game, right? Occasionally, that little red guy came across. And this went, that three sounds. And we thought life was white. Awesome. Life is good. Now, if you had a friend that lived down the street and you wanted to play this game right here, what had to happen? They came over. They had a joystick. You had a joystick. You went until you died. And then they went. And it kept the two scores over on the side. Okay? This is 1980s. This is today. These are the aliens right here that we are currently fighting. Yeah, Who is this? Somebody said it. This is Halo. <laughs> you guys are smiling. Those of you that play it. This, this is crazy. This is, this is, this, I just need to go, I wish this clicker would work faster than this. This is not this. Right? I'm going to show you that again. This. Am I right, guys? I mean, yeah. My daughter, I'm telling you right now, boys would think this is cool for about what? Five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. But this, this is awesome, right? This, they select everything, but here's the crazy thing. If they want to play somebody besides the, the computer, and they've got a buddy that plays, how do they connect? Online. They connect online, they play all over the what? World. They play all over the world. All over the world. How crazy is that? I mean, this is, oops, this is where we were, a little black joystick with a red button and a black cable stuck into the back of a box. I don't know if this is going through your mind. Some of you may be wearing you out because it's the simplicity of this. But if you were literally my age, you are literally in your 50s, and you're still thinking, this is what I teach in the classroom. This is what they're expecting. Does that make sense? Yes. Now some of you are like, well that sucks, Kevin. I ain't got that stuff. Right? <laughs> I don't I like, you know, I I don't know why I keep this that way. I like this one. I like my red button and I like the black joystick and it's been working for me for 42 years. <laughs> Kevin, do you know how many stinking how many stinking buttons are on this one? How many are there? Unlimited. I don't even know. They got buttons on the bottom, buttons on the top, buttons on the side. You hold A and you do this, you hold B and you do this. You have like 52 different things, right? So, I'm going to get off of this, but when I start talking about a change in perspective, looking at change differently for me. So here's what I'm going to, I'm going to share with you. I know you're not taking notes. Some of you are. Here's how they learn. We call it epic. 
We call it EPIC. I'm not going to leave you with just nothing to do. Here's, here's my takeaway. EPIC stands for this. Number one, it's experiential. They want to be a part of something that they get to experience. I'm going to share that with you. I taught four semesters at Abilene Christian University. Um, while I was there, it was an intro to fitness. Uh, my background was in healthcare and exercise physiology, and Mike and I, Mike Dax, he and I both had the same degree. Uh, we taught at Abilene Christian University. He had an 8 o'clock class, I had a 9.30 class on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The first semester that we ever taught, I'll just be honest with you, I taught it exactly the way I was taught. I stood back here, and I put the little stuff on the screen, and I just regurgitated information. And it was the most miserable, boring thing I've ever done in my life. Right? And for those four 40 students in each of our classes, they were probably thinking, well, this is just this is the way it is. So Mike and I put our heads together and said, hey, this is, this is not right. I mean, this is, we, we teach this stuff. We weren't doing what we're doing now, but we teach leadership. We teach uh, speaking. We, we teach all this sort of stuff. Let's, let's just do things different. So here's what we did. Starting the second semester, we changed it up. We started giving them different assignments. We started doing the teamwork stuff. I started, Mike started, every single class with an opening mixer. Every single one. Just like the Tada, about nine years ago, I told you a thing called three faces. I'd make them get in groups and do the thing called the human knot. I make them get in, and then when I ran out of stuff, they had to think of stuff. And I started every class. It's just two or three minutes, and it was chaos. It was it was loud. I'll be honest with you. And the kids that after the first or second, you know, week would say, "This, Mr. Tut, are we going to keep doing these stupid games every morning?" And I'd say, "What?" Yeah, we are. Don't you love them? Why don't you do the next one? All right, they go, oh, I ain't doing one. But here's the thing. We force them to become experiential. Here's how we ran our class, though. We stopped doing the stuff out of the book. We kept the content the same. But when we start talking about fitness, here's what we did. We had access to a gym. And some of you are like, well, we don't have that. Time. We had access to a gym. We started taking them at 10 o'clock at night. College students now, some of them are very difficult. But 10 o'clock at night, we'd say, hey, we're going to go, we're going to do this, we're going to do this body pump class. Hey, we're going to do this cycling class. Hey, we're going to do this. We're not going to meet. We're going to meet on, you know, Tuesday night at 10, and we're not going to meet on Friday. We started changing things up for their nutrition stuff. I would tell them, hey, get in a group. I want you to go eat dinner together. Go hang out, socialize, but I want you to bring the caloric intake of whatever, wherever you eat. I want you to find that. I want you to talk about it. And I just gave them these great, crazy projects, and here's what I started thinking. Why don't I run this undergrad program like a graduate program, right? Because that's the only thing different. The, the undergrad is, hey, here's the book, let me throw it at you. Graduate is, hey, here's the content, let me let you live it, right? Things changed. This was the most incredible assignment I ever gave them. And they came back later and said, you've changed the way I see things forever. I said, I want you all to go to a fitness center. Go to a gold gym, world gym, 24 hours, it don't matter. You go in there with a friend. You and a friend go in there. I mean, somebody in this class, not just me. You go in there, and I want you to take the tour, act interested, but you can't join. And they're all like, oh, that's fine. They came back. No, they didn't join, but they said that was the most miserable experience of their life. Why? Because, see, I can't teach what I know. I can't teach them. Not all people are going to treat you the same. See, some people are in this for your health. Some people are in this for what? For gain. And they're like, I know. I felt like they're going to make me sigh. Like, I don't even have a checkbook. I can't join. Please let me out of here. You know? And I'm like, the reason I did this, I want you to understand that. Because some of you are going to be in the fitness business. Some of you are going to be this. I want you to understand, what does it feel like to feel like you're forced into something you don't want to be doing? And they're just like, that was crazy, Mr. Dunn. I still see them now. They're like, because in Abilene, we're pretty small. They're like, hey, that whole thing you did that time, that was miserable. I really, I thought I was going to cry. I thought I had to call my dad and say, hey, will you come down here and get me this guy? won't let me out of the gym, okay? But here's the thing. When it was all over, they loved it. As a matter of fact, Dr. Rippey, uh, she's the dean of the exercise science. She called us in and said, hey, I want you guys to come down here. I want to show you something. I said, okay. So we show up to her uh, we get in her office. Uh, Dean Rippey has these pieces of paper, I mean, uh, these stacks of paper. She said, I want to talk to you all about your, your reviews, your appraisals, I'm sorry. 
I said, I didn't even know we had those. He goes, well, last year you didn't. I mean, you did, but they were just like everybody else's. But did y'all do something? Did you script your students to write something on there? And I said, I, Dr. Ruby, I have no idea what you're talking about. She said, this is unprecedented. We have never had this many handwritten notes on the bottom of an evaluation. She'd hand them across the table, and Mike and I just started laughing. Like, we're smiling. We're teaching some of that right there, man. That's what we're talking about. It was just a, the best teacher I've ever had. Why don't other people think, take things this, this, make it this much fun? Where is the other passion? Why don't they teach the others? Guess what we did to the other exercise biz teachers in that department? We kicked them off, right? We did. I'm honest. I knew them. I mean, because Ron actually went to school there. Like, Ron, I can't believe you took everybody to help them. That makes me look like an idiot. And Ron's like, well, I mean, Mike's like, well, well, just bring them on. Well, I don't have time for that. You do realize we made this open for who? Every teacher there. Not, I mean, all the other instructors. Like, y'all do it with us. Y'all do it with us. I don't have time for that. Y'all. The challenge is this. In order for it to be experiential, it's a little more what? It's a little more work. It's a little more difficult. Okay. Epic is, experiential number two is participatory. They want to participate. You know right now the number one shows on TV are what? Yeah. Reality shows. And that's all I'm going to say about that. I mean, <laughs> that's why they love I mean, because they can what? Because they can vote. Because they can vote. They can, they can have a say in, in the outcome. Um, and, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but I think I voted for Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> Guys, don't, don't hold it against me, but I did. I voted for the baseball player, you know, the, what, from the Cubs. I'm like, dude, that little man needs to win this. I mean, anybody that can gut it up and go out there and do that. Now they are mad at me for Dancing with the Stars. But here's the thing. We, they, they love this sort of stuff. They love to be able to vote. I mean, I'm sure y'all got some technology now, by now, where they can do stuff in class. And you can do, they, they just like that. I mean, if you don't have it, you've got to figure it out. Figure out a way to do some things where they get to not have a say, but they, have, they get to participate. Uh, third one is this. Image rich. Epic is experiential, participatory, and image rich. What I mean by that is... <laughs> Am I the only one with a daughter that is trying to go back in time? Like, she came home the other day from a junk store, and she was so fired up about this camera she bought that takes this stuff called film. Not Polaroid, that's hot. She's like, Dad, this thing's film. Like, you put it in there and you wind it. And I'm like, yeah. You know where you're going to get that developed? She's like, what do you mean? I go, Ain't nothing going to come out of there, honey. I mean, it... it but here's the thing. The cameras we grew up with, the, the best camera you had in the 80s and 90s pales in comparison to what? Your phone right here. I mean, your phone is all you need to be world class, right? And they're, and they're used to that. Here's what they're not used to. And I know you don't do this. But if you're still using a wax pencil, you know, and, a, and, and the little rolling thing like that that's all smeared, <laughs> I'm joking with you. If you are, I really need to stop doing that. But anyway, <laughs> that's not getting it done for them. When you start thinking about learning, they're used to things being awesome. As a matter of fact, my parents just recently, and, I, and I, I'm sad to say this, my parents just recently, we got them for Christmas, maybe two or three years ago, an HDTV. And they didn't know, they loved the Rangers, they loved the Mavericks. They really didn't know that the names were on the back of the jerseys for all these years. <laughs> Amen? I mean, you, my mom was like, oh, look, their names are on the... And I'm like, mom, they've been there for... But the TV they've been wa watching was literally like what? Just a glob of mass, like number 24. They knew his name was George, but they just thought that was like a thing up there, right? They're used to this sort of stuff. So just ask yourself, are the images and the, and the stuff that I'm using, is it high resolution? And then the last one is this, connected. They are very connected. Um, social media, teams, and projects. Um, you, need, you need to stay connected. Uh, I will say this. I know because my daughter's at ACU right now at Evan Christian University. Uh, my other daughter graduated from Texas A&M. And, &M, and she, she was, they were very well connected. And I know you guys are using a lot of that stuff. And I want to give you kudos for that. It's awesome that you do that. But I also do a thing for colleges, a sexual harassment thing. I'm just going to beg you to be smart. I'm just going to beg you 
but be smart. Because this, to me, is the slippery slope that you as an instructor can ever stand on. Because everybody's telling you, be connected, be connected, build community, connect with them, connect with them. And you're like, okay, I'll connect with them. Hey, good to see you in class today. And all of a sudden, what happens? What do you mean by good to see you in class? I didn't mean anything. I just meant, <laughs> throw my computer in the trash. That's what you're literally thinking, right? So the reason I share that with you is you've got to be connected. You've got to be. It's, it's, the way, it's the way the world is today. But I also know that you've got to be very careful. You're just simply, and I'm not going to have a sexual harassment thing right now. I'm just simply saying, respond, keep it professional, and move forward. Because they do expect that, and if, they, if, you, if you've got students who are like, hey, I appreciate you doing this, you can't get into this, hey, yeah, by the way, you're awesome. Oh, you're my favorite student. They just whoop, zip it, okay? Fair enough? Everybody got that? Okay. So this is how they learn. It's called Epic. Uh, I've got about 25 minutes. I'm going to share with you just two more things. We start talking about being an everyday superhero. How you can keep your cape on and how you keep things moving forward. All right. You have to have a plan and an execution strategy. You have to have a plan and an execution strategy. Let me share something with you. A plan without a strategy is what? It's what? It's worthless. A plan without a strategy is worthless. Um, you do know the number one thing every year for, uh, for a New Year's resolution is what? Lose weight. Lose weight. If I were to ask each of you, hey, give me a plan for losing weight, I would have 120 what? Different plans. Here's the crazy thing. Every single plan you give me will work if I have a what? If I have a strategy. Yeah. I've got to be committed to that strategy. It doesn't matter if it's a, hey, we got this chocolate diet. You're, all you're going to eat for six weeks is chocolate. You're going to eat, but you can only eat certain kind of chocolate at a certain time of the day. And if you stick to that, there's probably a good chance your body's going to get jacked up and you're probably going to lose some weight, right? But the thing is, you have just reading stuff. I'm going to share a story with you. Uh, get, uh, my business partner, Mike Dag. And I'm going to share a story where this is so true. They had just uh, made a decision to take a trip of a lifetime. They, he and his family, his wife and his, his son at the time, he's about five years old, his name's Lucas. They made a decision to go to Disney World. How many of you have ever been to Disney World? Awesome. It's, Disney World to me is like a little bit creepy because it's so perfect, right? I mean, it like looks real. Like that really looks like a massive toy. There's no part of it that I can tell, hey, they built this. It's like it really is there. It really is a massive thing. It's just crazy. So they get there and they're all excited. At the time of the story, Lucas' favorite movie is Toy Story. Tell me a little bit about Toy Story. What happens in that movie? They come alive. They come alive. Yeah, the, the, the toys come alive. So they get there, they're going to be there for seven days, and uh, they check into the movie time resort. That's, they have actually have a, a Toy Story room. It's got all decorated with Toy Story. It's awesome and everything's good. And, uh, that next morning they get up and they go to the Magic Kingdom. Mike is type A. He's going to go to Magic Hours. He's going to stay there all day. He's going to get every you know penny out of his trip. He's got a four-year-old, a five-year-old son with him. They head over there to uh, Magic Kingdom, and they've been there for about oh maybe about nine o'clock. He said Lucas starts kind of having a meltdown, kind of getting tired. They kind of survive till till lunch, and then around one o'clock it's just over. Like Lucas is freaking out. He's crying. He's hot. He wants to go back to the house, and so they go into a, to a gift shop and they buy him a Buzz Lightyear, you know, a little two-foot-tall Buzz Lightyear. Man, that made him happy. He's good. He's playing with the Buzz Lightyear. They keep going to some shows, doing some things. Uh, about another three or four hours goes by. He said it's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Again, he's ready to go. He's crying. He's not having fun. So they get back to another gift shop. This time they find a Woody the Cowboy doll. And that's all really that, that uh, Lucas had wanted. He just wanted to get these two things. So he's got Woody the Cowboy, so you pull the string, he says there's a snake in my boot and someone water, and that boy's in the water hole, and he seems to be good. Now they're literally trying to stay until dark for what reason? The fireworks. The fireworks, yeah, they're literally just trying to survive until that point. So Mike says finally, the fireworks get there, Lucas is crying, he's on his shoulders, he's got buzz, he's got Woody, he's got his hat kicked backwards, Lucas is crying, and there goes the fireworks, he said, it just wasn't the Kodak moment. He's like, it's just not something you're going to send home to mom. And then there's the fireworks going. He's like, it was just, we're dry, walking back to the car. He's like, oh, this is, this is unreal. I mean, to the show. On the way out, though, they bought one more thing. They bought this Mylar balloon that looked like Mickey Mouse. 
So they got Mickey Mouse, they got Woody, they got Buzz, they got Lucas. They get on the shuttle. It's about, about 9 o'clock that night, and Lucas immediately falls asleep. Mike looks at Caroline and goes, hey, I, I can't do this for six more days. <laughs> it's supposed to be the happiest place on, on the planet. Right? It's pretty rough. Caroline says, well, hey, if you'll stop type A, we can, we, can, we can slow this thing down. Why don't we do this? Why don't tomorrow we go to Animal Kingdom? We'll go over there. We'll, we'll stay till about 9.30 or 10. We'll come back. We'll shuttle back. We'll take a nap, eat lunch here at the hotel, maybe swim till about 2 o'clock. Refresh, go back over here about four o'clock, stay till dark, and then the animals will be out. And like Mike's like, hey, that, that sounds perfect. So that's what they do. They get up, head over to Animal Kingdom. So about 9 30 or 10, they get on the shuttle and they take them back to the hotel room. And Mike says, as they're walking up, fixing uh, to get to the door, Luke is hollers out, Look, Dad, there's Mickey. And Mike looks around, like, Where, 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 where? He goes, No, right there, right there. And he looks and he goes, Oh, well, that Mylar balloon that they had brought home, somebody had wedged it between the curtain and the window. It's right there at Lucas's face. And Mike's like, oh, that, that's kind of neat. I don't know who did that. And he opens the door. I mean, puts the, the key in the door. As he pushes it open, Mike can tell somebody has been in the room. Something is going on in the room. And Lucas just darts in there. He's like this. Mike's like, what the heck is going on? He said he walks in there, and this is what he saw. The TV is on Disney Channel. Turned up pretty loud. He looked over on the bed, and there's Buzz and Woody propped up. There's a bucket of popcorn between them. Both of them have a Sprite with a straw going towards their mouth, and, and the remote control is laying on Woody's leg, and Lucas is like, Dad, Dad, they were alive! They were alive! That means we ruined it! And Mike said, Kevin, it looked legit! Like, literally, but, hey, they're not going to be back until 8 tonight. Let's watch a movie. And we opened the door, they just went, they just felt, he said it was, it was like the crazy, like I just kept looking at it. Lucas like, Dad, we gotta go, we gotta go. And, and Mike's trying to explain, Lucas, no, no, no. And by the way, Lucas, he's still in counseling for this whole thing. <laughs> but he said, Kevin, it, it, it was amazing. And then there's that, there's that Mickey Mouse balloon, and here's the thing. He said this, he said, you know, I had to go downstairs. I go, hey, who did this? I mean, this is awesome. This is the greatest thing. He ended up finally talking to the manager, found out that it was a, a young lady. So who did do this? Who, who did this for them? Environmental services, yeah. Found out that this was a young lady that had done this. English was a second language. And he started talking to the guy about how this happened. So i got to share something with you. They were there seven days. They met all the, the princesses and the, the, the heroes and all that sort of stuff. Got their picture made. But the only story they ever shared was created by who? Housekeeping. By housekeeping. Do you know what the mission statement of Disney is? Two words, create magic, create magic. So let me ask you something. Who created that magic for them, that young lady? But I'm going to share something with you. I think Disney is different. I think Central Texas College, you guys are going to have to be different. I think organizations have to make the decision to be a certain way. Or let's, let me share, let's just be honest. She did that. She created magic. But I will say this, I will almost guarantee you that if she were to move to Colleen, Texas and go to work at the Hampton where I stay, she's not going to be creating what? She is not going to be creating magic, right? She's not. Every time I go into Hampton, there's nobody in the Hampton creating magic for Kevin. I promise you, right? Because it's not a what? It's not an expectation. They think giving me two bottles of water is world class. Oh, thank you, Mr. Duck, for being a diamond member. I've only spent $20,000 with y'all this year. Let me give you your prize. What do I get? Two, two bottles of water. Do you know what a case of water costs from Sam's? The expense on a bottle of water is seven cents. I get 14 cents worth of crap because I am world class to them, right? Let me show you something. She is not, she would not move from Orlando to Colleen and create magic. Not because she's not capable of, but because Hampton, Hilton, nobody else has what? It is not their plan and it's not their execution strategy. They're really not. You see, Disney is planning for it. And here's how it works. I've been to Disney University before. It's awesome. I mean, the, the class. It's awesome. They take all of their environmental services and they have brainstorming sessions. 
How do we do this? How do we create magic? Well, here's what I've done. I've done this with Buzz and Woody. I've had people tell me we had Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs were all lined up. They were all down on their knees. We came in and there's Snow White laid. I mean, it's just, and they go, hey, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Guess what they have on their carts? They got Pepsis. They got Sprite. They got popcorn. Do they do that for everybody every time? No, they don't. I've been to Disney. They didn't create this crazy thing for me, but I did. will tell you this. Every time I came in, guess what? I don't know how they fold those towels <laughs> into the crazy character, but I'm like, dude, there's Goofy. There's Winnie the Pooh. I mean, as you walk in, you immediately see it. And it's neat, but they, it doesn't just happen. Nobody at the Hamptons folding my towels up like that. Like, hey, I don't know what they would fold it as, but they're just not. So my challenge is this. Do you have a plan to be successful on Monday? Because if your plan is better fill in the blank, this year I'm going to have more than you fill in the blank. If that's all you've got, you've got nothing. Does that make sense? You've got to know how you're going to get there. And I talked about we're going to have, in high school today, we're going, to have a, we're going to increase our graduation rate. That's our plan. We're going to increase graduation rate. And no, you're not. If you just put a thing on the board, increase graduation rates, at the end of the year, you're going to say, please, God, that we win. <laughs> oh, we got one student. We've met our goal. Woo, that's awesome. We work. You know, I don't mean to be cynical, but I will tell you this. Without a plan, what changes? Nothing. Nothing. Just like Disney. How many of you ever been to Six Flags? Is Six Flags Disney? Could it be? Yes. It could be. It's a simple what? It's a simple choice. It really is. I, I love Six Flags. But Six Flags is not Disney. Because they made a decision. Right? This is who we're going to be. Okay. So have a plan and execute it. And then my last point is this. Create hope. I think this is one of the single most important things that you'll do for this generation and do for your for your kiddos. Create hope. Some of you have heard this story, but it was nine years ago, and it applies so much, and it's why I'm so thankful for what you do and how you changed and impacted my life that I'm going to share it again. Um, I've already told you a little bit about my math paralysis, right? Um, when I was in high school, right out of eighth grade, I went into high school over there to the, to the counselor. My brother's four years older than me. And he gave me this incredible advice. He said, Kevin, when you get to high school, here's what you need to do. Take math your first and second year, and then your junior and senior year, you won't have to take any, right? Anybody else, brother, give them this, this wonderful advice? Okay. So guess what? That's, that's what I did. I go in, and I take, you know, I take algebra one my freshman year, and I take geometry my sophomore year. So my junior and senior year of high school, I do not take a math. I go to Abilene Christian University for two years. That's four years. I don't take a math. I get married and stay home. Not home, but I go to work. I'm at four. I, I get married. My wife goes to car reporting school for two years. We move from Abilene to San Marcos, Texas, where she's working in Austin, Texas. And I've got whoop, these two years right here to finish up. Right? That's eight years since I've what? Eight years since I've taken math. Boy, it's a <laughs> it's different. So here's what happens. It's my last semester. My parents are ready for me to graduate. My wife is ready for me to graduate. My friends are ready for me to graduate. I'm ready to graduate. All I have left is math and anatomy and physiology. I got one more. AP, I mean, AP is going to be fine. I, I got that. So I'm taking this, this last semester, but I, I saved it for the very end. Uh, all I'm taking are two classes, and here's what happens. I've already told you where I went to school, so we're just going to throw them under the bus. Who cares? So I go in that class that morning, and it's very similar to the class that I spoke to y'all in nine years ago. It's a theater style like that. So I, I walk in, sitting about six rows up, there had to be about 200 of us in the class, and uh, the professor comes in, the instructor, he comes in, and has a, a, a table, I mean, a podium just like this. He walks around the front, and he's got these pieces of paper. And he walks to the front of each aisle, and he drops a little packet, and he says, please take one and pass it to the person behind you. He passes those out. Now, how many years has it been since I've had a math? Eight, Eight years. 
I honestly thought, and others my age, y'all get this, I thought maybe they'd just let me grandfather in, right? I thought at some point, the poor guy so old, just just let it, just, just don't do math, Kevin. Just just don't ever do math. You know, I, I don't think I don't ever. He passes these out, and this is where he said, take one, pass it to the people behind you. I got my paper, passed it on. I'm sitting there. I guess I'm in my mid-20s, trying to get out of school, and I look down there, and I've got on the front and back, it's 50 algebraic equations, 25 on each side. Why do I know it's algebraic equations? Well, I'm in an algebra class. Yeah, and they're, they're just, so I just figured that's what it is. So I'm sitting there looking at this, and here's what he does. Ladies and gentlemen, this is algebra, college algebra, yada, yada, yada. Uh, what you have in front of you are 50 uh, problems that are very basic. Uh, you should have learned these in high school. What I'm going to ask you to do, if you will complete those uh, and then turn it back in, that's all we're going to do this class period. If for any reason you don't understand or you can't solve any of those 50 uh, problems, you are in the wrong class and you'll need to go to the registered office and drop. And he went over and he said it. And I'm sitting there thinking, huh, this is, <laughs> I got this, that ain't, uh, I'm pretty competitive. So I immediately go back to my algebra and I go, okay, I know I do stuff in the brackets first, right? Yeah. <laughs> Two times six, I guess. So what's that little thing? What's that little thing? So after about three minutes, I do what? Exactly what he said. I very respectfully and politely walked up. I just put it on this table, walked across the campus, went to my register, and I did what? I dropped the class. This was pre-cell phone. So I, my, my wife worked, we lived in Austin actually. I got in the car and I drove back to, to Austin. And, uh, I went up straight to Austin Community College, Rio Grande campus. Had an advisor there that had helped me, she was an angel. And uh, I went and, and I am stressed out. I mean, I'm gonna be the only guy in the history of college that's three hours short of graduating and I, I didn't get it done, right? So I go in her office, I'm kind of stressed out. I'm like, hey, here's what's going on. I don't know if there's a class I can take here. That they, they kick me out of class down there. I'm just going, she's like, hey, 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 Kevin, just calm down, just calm down. But we did have computers. Now, when I started at Southwest Texas, we had the little books, you know, you had to turn the pages, and I mean, that was ridiculous. But we are computerized now. She flipped it, she goes, hey, I got a class right here on Rio Grande campus. It's actually here tonight. Uh, it's a 6.30 class Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I can get you in there tonight, and this will count. This will transfer, and you'll, you'll, gra you'll graduate. I'm like, awesome. Put me in there. Put me down. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. So I'm all excited now. I drive over to where my wife is, uh, is, is working. Uh, she worked at the 100 Congress building. Uh, you talk about two hillbillies living in Austin, Texas. They were, 100 Congress is that, is that weird shape uh, building right on the lake. And so I go there, I, I ride the elevator up there, and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, hey, I had to drop that class. She's like, what? You dropped the class? You can't drop the class. I'm like, no, no, I've already got it figured out. I've already got it figured out. But I can't call you, but I won't be home. I'm gonna, I got a 6.30 Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. It's like, okay, awesome. So I go to this class. Now, it's 6.30 in the evening. I pull up there, walk in the classroom. That's very different. It's like this little section right here. It's just a small room, maybe 25 tables, I mean, 25 desks in there. This maybe 15 of us are sitting there, and uh, in walks the, the instructor. Now, Austin, Texas is different than the rest of Texas, right? <laughs> so the instructor comes walking in, and I am not making this up. I, at the time, if I had a phone, I'd take a picture. The instructor comes walking in like this, and he literally looks like Fabio with dark hair, okay? <laughs> he's got on these white beach pants, he's got on some flip flops, he's got the, the beads on, the long curly hair, and at this point I'm like, got a chance. <laughs> got a chance. Because the other guy was in a couple of times. And he says this. He walks right up in front of us, he's like, hey, I know why every one of you are in this class. And I'm like, okay? He goes, you're all second semester seniors, and you need a math credit, don't you? And I'm like, yes, please, please don't kick me out. He looked at all and he says, I got, I got some good news for you. I'm going to ask you to do something for me. If you will show up to every class, if you will turn in your assignments on time, and you'll be here and put, first, put forth your best effort on test day, 
I will guarantee every single one of you will make an A in this class. What? I was like, yes! <laughs> I didn't really say that, but that's what I'm thinking. So let me ask you something. How many class periods did I miss? None. 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 How many homework assignments did I not turn in? None. None. And how many tests did I miss? None. 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 That's what I carried in that class. Amen. An easy A. And here's why. After about an hour with him, I learned what? I learned algebra. Once I started coming back, I'm like, oh, I got this, I got this. Hey, I can go back to my other class now is really what I'm thinking. I just needed somebody to do what? Just help me. I just need somebody to create what? Just some create some hope. Because you know what? I want to put forth the effort. I know I'm a slacker. I got it, buddy. You don't have to tell me for eight years I've been trying to avoid this. I got it. I've learned my lesson. Don't make me not ever finish. Get it? Because sometimes we're that way. Hey, I'm going to teach you a lesson. I've probably learned my lesson. And some of you go, Kevin, they still haven't learned it yet. I'm going to keep whipping them until they've learned it. They've learned it. At some point, take a step back, take a deep breath, and say, you know what? i got an idea. I'm going to give you a chance. But I'm going to walk through it with you. I want to end with this. But this is truly why I love what you do. I truly love. I'm the, I'm the speaker every year at NYSA for the, for the awards program. For their, for their uh, excellent awards. And I've taken an honor to do that because you people truly save people's lives. You truly change legacies of families. And I truly believe that. I'm not, that's not just lip service. I have seen it. You have seen it. You have done it. And I just want to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart that you're willing to sacrifice and put your life where you're doing what you do to make those changes. Because let's be honest, some of the people that come to your school, you were their first choice. Some of the people that come to your school were what? You were not. It was not their first choice. Matter of fact, it's literally their last what? Chance. It's their last chance. And when you have that change in perspective, that third world mentality to a first world mentality. You know who the ones are that, that, that you can kick around. You know the ones that are like, dude, you're, you're just slacking. You're, you're not trying. You push them and push them and push them. You know those. But then you know the other ones. And you know this for a fact. If you don't, you, you should. People are already looking for a reason to what? To quit. They come in looking for a reason to quit. They just need one more excuse. I, I've got a kid at home, I've got a this, I've got a that, I've got a job, I've got a career, I've got, I just don't have time for this. Somebody just give me one more reason and I'm going to quit. Don't be that. Don't be that. You are that reason that says you're not going to quit. You're not going to do this because I truly believe you saved those people's lives. I, if I went with every one of you right now, you can list a person that was a stay-at-home, I mean not a stay-at-home, was a single mom that had kids at home that's going through this, right? Show of hands. We all we know these people, right? Here's a new one. Here's a new one. I was a single mom who's now an empty nester. How lost is that person? Right? I don't even I, I, I don't even have kids to fight for anymore. I'm looking for what? Someone in this room to help me what? Create hope. Because I want a different life. And I'm looking for y'all to save my life. Guys, what you do, if you hear nothing else I say, hear this. What you do matters. What you do makes a difference. And that difference and that change you make in that person's life is what I truly believe makes this the greatest state in the union and makes this the greatest country in the world. Thank you guys so much for what you do. God bless you and have a great year.